Christopher Hitchens, Washington correspondent for The Nation magazine, in this morning's New York Times, the following quote from Mike Barnes, congressman from Maryland, a liberal. I came down here very skeptical, but I have reluctantly come to the conclusion that the invasion was justified. U.S. citizens were in danger or had a reasonable basis to believe they were in danger because a small group of hoodlums had taken over this country. That quote about Mr. Barnes's trip to Grenada. Your, your comment. My comment is that that's probably what most Americans think, and I think it's a mistaken view. Uh, you have to separate two things. One is uh, the safety of Americans, and the second thing is the right to invade another country. Now, even if it could be proved that the American students on the island were in danger, and that's very much disputed by everybody and by the students themselves, um, that might, for instance, justify an Entebbe raid of the kind the Israelis conducted in Uganda, or a Desert One of the kind that the United States tried to conduct in Iran. But in neither of those cases was the objective of the mission the overthrow of the government in power in Uganda or Iran. Uh, you might be justified in going in and getting the students out, and there'd be no difficulty doing that in a country the size of Grenada. But it's perfectly obvious that President Reagan's concern was to overthrow the government of Grenada. And uh, whether the students were in danger or not, that's what he wanted to do. Christopher Hitchens. So I think, I just sorry, can I say one thing? I think it's a real shame that uh, someone as perceptive as uh, Michael Barnes uh, should have been um, hoodwinked in this way. As we were saying, Mr. Hitchens, uh, for the last uh, four years, has been with The Nation magazine, been here in Washington for the last two years. He has uh, traveled to Grenada and Lebanon within the last uh, 18 months. And uh, among other things, besides working for The Nation here in this country, uh, he works also and writes for The Spectator in London and is the foreign editor of the New Statesman magazine, also published out of England, writing a book about the uh, Cyprus crisis in the, in the uh, Middle East. And uh, as far as uh, educational background, graduated from Lee's School in Cambridge, also attended uh, Oxford, graduated in philosophy, politics, and economics in 1970, married, expecting his first child, originally from Portsmouth, Hampshire, in England. Tell us, uh, before we jump into all the substance mm -hmm. this morning, uh, Christopher, about uh, these publications, is, what is The Nation? Well, The Nation is the oldest weekly magazine in the United States. It was founded in 1865 by a group of basically abolitionist, anti-slavery liberals. And it's maintained a position on the left of the spectrum ever since. I, I think one could say that of the mainstream American weeklies, uh, we were the most radical. Um, and uh, as a result, some say, as a result, uh, perhaps we have one of the smaller circulations. I think we probably sell about 60,000 a week, but we are certainly read by far more than that. Uh, and we know from our letters column uh, that we get a lot of take up. Um, Who owns it? Nobody. Um, it would probably be very cheap to buy, but you can't buy it. It's kind of a trust, you know, there's no proprietor. So we have, though we have very little money, in exchange for having no money, we do have complete independence. We don't have to answer to anybody. Um, at the moment, um, probably our chief concern is foreign policy and the, the way that the United States under President Reagan um, is taking a harder line in the world um, and internationally. And uh, it's a course we consider very dangerous and I suppose your readers would have guessed roughly our position or my position from our very first exchange about Congressman Barnes. Let me ask you about the New Republic. How do you do? You, do you follow the New Republic? Yourself? Sure. Yes, I've even what's, written for the New Republic. What's the difference between the New Republic liberalism and the Nation liberalism? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, we've uh, we used to be rather closer together than we are now in the older days when things were simpler, and we were both, as it were, associated with the New Deal, with that kind of liberalism. The New Republic has gone a long way to the right since then. Um, since Marty Peretz uh, bought it, um, you can buy the New Republic, can't buy the Nation. Um, he's moved it to the right on a whole number of issues, especially on foreign policy and principally on the Middle East. Uh, they take a very, very firm line in defense of uh, whatever Israel should decide to do. And um, as a result, in my opinion, their whole international policy has become more conservative. Christopher Hitchin, there's a lot of news this morning. It's, actually, I shouldn't mm -hmm. say news, more analysis in our papers. Sure. Let's look at the front page of the New York Times. There's a story here by Les Gelb, who was a former employee of the Carter administration, right. the State Department, writes now of foreign affairs for the New York Times. Schultz pushing a hard line becomes key voice in crisis. This is a long piece on the front page. I'm going to turn inside here uh, to page 15. I want to quote to you something that's said in this piece. 
By the way, do you have any response to the headline in that story? Have you had a chance to look at it? I've had a look at the story, yeah. Do you think Mr. Schultz is in a, more, a stronger position now than he used to be? Well, it struck me as an odd story for those of you who haven't read it. It says that Schultz is now arguing more and more as Secretary of State for hardline policy, for boldness and intervention and so on, and that he's become a policy maker. This is in response to a lot of stories that have said that he's always being overruled, and particularly when Judge Clark was National Security Advisor. Let me read you a paragraph from this story by Les Gelb. The common, <coughs> a common theme to the responses recommended by Mr. Schultz, this is what Mr. Gelb was saying, mm -hmm. and approved by Mr. Reagan as uh, put together from descriptions by officials has been this. Now, this is the overall theme that Mr. Schultz is supposedly pushing in the administration. Be tough, even to the point of using force, if necessary. Keep negotiation lines open but do not be optimistic about positive results, and meanwhile, solidify positions of strength. What do you think of that idea as a, as a, a method of going after foreign policy? Well, it may, I mean, it, like, it sounds good, you know, it sounds statesmanlike, uh, but it, actually it's just saying the obvious. It's what anyone would do. Um, what, we, what we don't know is if that's what he really means or if, if the policies he's arguing for really conform to that. What I, I have a suspicion is that uh, the Secretary of State is annoyed that in, in the past on foreign policy he's been rather left out. Um, and the stronger personalities of the President, of Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick, and until recently of Judge Clark were in a sense making policy without him, or at least making policy and then telling him about it. I think this is an attempt by him to get back on board. And it obviously he's orchestrated it quite well as far as the New York Times is concerned. You're from England originally. Yeah. Uh, you write for the nation. Uh, you read our newspapers. Does mm -hmm. a piece like this in the New York Times have any influence? Oh, sure. Yeah. And by Gell, because he's thought to, to know what he's on about, about State Department matters, uh, which he does. Um, I don't know if Mr. Mr. Schultz also helped to write the piece. I've, I, it slightly reads like it. I mean, it certainly gives the Schultz view of the world and puts it in a rather flattering way. Let me show you a piece in this morning's Washington Post. This is on page three. Yeah. Media chose wrong target in hitting subordinates for blackout. Now, this is a piece by Lou Cannon, who uh, has followed Mr. Reagan for years. Uh, used to write for Ritter Publications in California. Has been with mm -hmm. the Washington Post for at least the last uh, 10, 15 years. Wrote a book called Reagan. And now he's talking about the way the press was handled by the Reagan White House during the Grenada crisis. Let me read you a couple of paragraphs and get your response. Reagan and company believe that uh, they won a pair of glorious victories on the beaches of Grenada two weeks ago. By the way, do you think they did in, in the sense that the, the, were they successful in doing what they wanted to do in Grenada? Um, I don't think anyone can deny it was a successful invasion. I don't know how proud it makes you feel to be able to knock out the Grenadian army, but you certainly did. Okay. The first was the defeat of the ragtag Grenadian army and a band of armed Cuban laborers. The second was the rout of the U.S. media. Reagan's advisors are convinced that the media are virtually devoid of public support in their protests of both the news block out of the invasion and the misleading statements made about it. He go, Mr. Cannon goes on to write, the advisors are probably right, meaning the Reagan advisors. On the whole, the news media response has been less effective than Cuban anti-aircraft fire and has been directed at secondary targets. Well, I think that's well put. Um, and I, my sense is, as a journalist, that that's true, that the public often think that we're spoiled and that we're too inclined to snipe and criticize and carp and cavil, which is our job and actually, you know, you should be grateful that we do it. But I think there's a certain satisfaction always to see us put down. And um, I think that Cannon is right in saying that when American troops are in action, people don't like the press, you know, being too critical. Uh, so they don't mind that in effect the government um, controlled the news about the initial landing in Grenada. I mean, I think you should mind. I'm looking at you out there. I think that ought to matter to you. But my feeling is that probably uh, there wasn't much protest about it. Let me read you another paragraph. It's the final paragraph mm -hmm. in Mr. Cannon's column. In the give and take of political life before he was President Reagan's uh, good nature usually overcame his suspicions, talking about the suspicion of the media and acting in conspiratorial ways. Oh. But in the isolation of the White House, where his worst inclinations are reinforced by the media strategy of his advisors, Reagan values secrecy and lie detector tests and regards even little leaks of information as mortal sins. The problem does not begin with his subordinates. What do you think of Mr. Reagan and that attitude? Well, he's not paranoid about the press in the way that, say, President Nixon was. He doesn't hate the press. He's quite good at talking to people. And, you know, in many respects, he's a nice guy and um, gets on with, with journalists. But it's true, anyone who's president after a while begins to think the press has it in for them. 
and uh, Reagan's no exception to that. The lie detector thing is a laugh, of course, but um, there are other things where I thought he was uh, he was almost neurotic. I mean, on the uh, on the case of the briefing gate papers, the missing Carter papers, where he said, you know, that the Pentagon papers were the, were the comparison, not to what the press was doing, but to what he was doing, and comparing it to theft and comparing himself to the theft of the Pentagon papers. That struck me as as a guy who really was beginning to feel, you know, he was surrounded by enemies. And that, that's an unhealthy attitude for the president to have to the press. I see that everyone's a little busy this morning on a Monday. It's unusual. All lines except two from the West are already lighted. We'll go to the phones uh, right now at area code 202-628-2525 and 202-783-2727. Remember, if you've called us within the last 30 days, please hold off and let others participate. A sad note. For those of you who follow the Washington Times or journalism, uh, a famous uh, Washington uh, reporter over the years and editorial page editor of the Washington Times has died of cancer, uh, Ann Crutcher, 64 years old. She was a guest here on this program within the last six months and wa worked for years for the Washington Star and has been with the Washington Times uh, since its beginning a couple of years ago. That's Ann Crutcher, dead at 64 of cancer, editorial page editor of the Washington Times on the front page of the Washington, I'm sorry, the USA Today. Carter Ford, keep our cool. This is from a meeting that uh, was held under the auspices of former President Jimmy Carter down at Emory University. And the consensus on the part of the two former presidents in Lebanon, we ought to keep our cool, don't retaliate, and hope for negotiations. Quick response from you, and we got a phone call waiting. OK, well, um, again, you know, that sounds like good advice, but um, you're going to have to decide in Lebanon. I mean, there is no point in having the army there if it isn't going to fight, and if it is going to fight, you better know who you're fighting for. And uh, that's the Lebanese Falange Party, which I don't think is a very good choice of ally. Schofield, Wisconsin. Good morning. You're on with Christopher morning, Hitchens. Brian. How are things going there? Doing pretty good, pretty sir. Good. How are you this morning? Well, fine. We don't have to get a morning paper around here. As a matter of fact, I quit the paper altogether. <coughs> How come? Excuse me. Well, I just can't uh, <laughs> digest Gannett's news. So you, Looking at paper up here. I see. What's uh, what's on your mind this morning? Now, I'd just like to ask this gentleman if, uh, how he would like, and I would like to see the Russians take over this country and see how they would report under the Russians' uh, form of government. They seem to tear this government all to hell and shred it all to pieces on the minute, uh, littlest things. I can't buy that. It's constantly and constantly. I was a World War II veteran. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't want one of them guys sitting alongside of me in the uh, foxhole or up in the plane. Okay, let's see what... I uh, think they're two-faced all the way through. All right, let's see uh, what Mr. Hitchens has to say. Well, um, I missed the Second World War, so I can't really comment on that, but I think uh, most of the people I've talked to who were in it uh, have no complaints about the way it was reported and didn't mind sharing foxholes with a lot of very brave journalists and photographers, many of whom gave their lives to report the news. Uh, and if you think that um, the photograph of the Marine Corps raising the flag on Iwo Jima is a good enough photograph for the uh, Arlington Monument to the Marine Corps, then I think it's probably good enough for me. Uh, that's on that. On, as to the Russians taking over the country, well, um, their attitude to the press is the same as yours seems to be, which is that uh, the less of it, the better. Um, I don't know if that irony has occurred to you. You don't seem to be on other things very pro-Russian. What do you read uh, through the reports that uh, Mr. Andropov has been out of public eye for some time? They say he's sick, could be very sick. Yeah, well, today being the anniversary of the Russian Revolution is, is the, big, the big day in the Soviet Union. And for him to miss that parade must mean he's ill. Tempe, Arizona, good morning. Go ahead, please. Morning, Brian Lamb and uh, Mr. Christopher Hitchens, okay? Uh, sure. Hey, uh, morning. I'm glad to talk to somebody from England. You do make sense to me. Your dialogue is true. And uh, I will philosophize in a minute here and then hope you'll answer a question of, of mine as a philosopher, a seeker of the truth. Uh, you talk about the republic as the uh, liberalism and the house as liberalism as the, as the ruling factors of uh, these elected officials who are in conflict, okay? Uh, over here in America, in the United States of America, we have the ultra-liberals and the conservatives, okay, which are, which are in conflict. So therefore, I am a conservative, so I am, in a sense, a troublemaker to them who want their thing, and I like to have my freedom, uh, not communist style or Marxist style or dialectic materialism, which is a separation of God, uh, which is I believe in God as a spirit in a positive way. These people say, no, they are God themselves, okay? 
So therefore, as I am a conservative, which is in opposition to the liberals, then they are materialists, okay? So their dialogue and their language do not make sense to me, okay? So therefore, I am a philosopher and a seeker of the truth, and when you have the truth on your side, then I cannot agree to a wrong. All right, so how about a question for Mr. Hitchens? Okay, now you know the PLO, and you read the magazines, and I got the newspapers here, that the Tepe Daily News and the uh, Arizona Republic and the Mesa Tribune, okay, they are in conflict. They're saying one thing here and, and another, and you have pictures and magazines. These are a way of knowing how the conservatives, the liberals, and in-betweeners, okay? And if you're in-between, then you're not knowing what side you're on. Now, as you, you, you appear to me as a person who is more of a conservative, are you? Well, I really haven't been doing my job in that case. No, no I'm not a conservative, um, and nor is The Nation magazine a conservative magazine. Um, I mean, you couldn't, you've asked me a very easy and a very difficult question. No, I'm not. Um, I can't think how you got the impression. Uh, we define ourselves as a liberal radical uh, magazine, and I, I think I said at the beginning, we're probably, of the available magazines in the United States, the most, um, the most radical in the mainstream. Um, is there any difference in American politics between liberals and conservatives? Well, since we began with Michael Barnes, um, I'd say this morning the gap was narrowing. Uh, if Michael Barnes can, can uh, fall in behind Reagan's invasion of Grenada, then, then liberals are getting mushier all the time. Good call standing by in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Good morning. Good morning, Oak Ridge. Yeah, I'm here. Go right ahead. Good morning. I just ran and turned on, on the TV. Yeah, uh, I was interested in the first statement you just made about uh, the uh, government, the uh, United States government, uh, going in there, and uh, it would have been okay if, with an NTB type raid, but that we took over from an established government. Well, now, my understanding was that whatever established government was there had been massacred about a, two weeks before. Now, uh, is, it, is it just okay that, is that his idea of an established government to, to uh, you know, no, I understand your question. one government and then, then say, well, we're it? Right. Here's the front page, by the way, of the New York Times this morning. A hundred bodies are reported found near a training camp in Grenada. U.S. official says former premier is presumed to be one of the victims found on the island. Uh, you can respond both yeah. to this story and to the yes. position of the lady from Oak Ridge. It's a very good question from Oak Ridge. I mean, it's a good criticism of my position, but I'll still stick to it. You see, in, in the cases I mentioned, Iran and Uganda, the Entebbe raid and the Desert One raid to rescue hostages in both cases, in both those cases, the governments of the two countries concerned were, A, chaotic, barely governments at all, and B, to the extent that they were governments, extremely unpleasant. I mean, General Amin and the Ayatollah Khomeini would belong in any kind of central casting um, of rogues. Uh, nonetheless, it doesn't give the United States the right to appoint uh, governments for those countries. In fact, the reason you have the Ayatollah is because the United States for so long did believe that it had a big say in who should govern Iran. Uh, now, in Grenada, it's true, there was a, a horrendous massacre of the, of the existing government, including Maurice Bishop, who, who was the prime minister, who I'd met and uh, interviewed several times and rather admired in many ways. So uh, you won't find me defending the Grenadian government uh, of that day, but I, I'm still sticking to my point. It isn't up to the United States to decide who runs Grenada. Long Beach, California. Good morning. You're on with Christopher Hitchens of The Nation magazine. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi. Oh, Brian? Yes. Uh, my compliments to C-SPAN. I think that perhaps uh, the nation and the world would be well served if all journalists, correspondents, and media were as impartial, objective, etc., as, as you seem to be. Thank you. I appreciate uh, watching C-SPAN. Enjoy it very much. Question for your guest this morning. He's very upfront about being liberal. I appreciate the, the fact that he is upfront about that. Uh, I'll be upfront too. I'm a conservative. My question to him is, what does he perceive to be the government in Granada that we overthrew, if in fact we did overthrow a government? That's it? Uh, uh, that's it, yes. Yeah, uh, you, you may have been uh, dialing your call when I was talking to the last questioner, because I 
but I, I'll, I'll, I'll try and rephrase it for you. Um, I knew Morris Bishop, interviewed him several times, quite admired him, had no time at all for the, uh, what looked in the short time it was in power to be a very gruesome uh, military despotism that overthrew him. But um, what I have gone on to say to the lady from Oak Ridge, I think it was, Tennessee, was that I stick to my initial point that that, that, that does not give the United States government the right to intervene. Let me go back while we're waiting for our next call and ask you again about the difference between being a conservative and being a liberal. Yes, yeah, by point. all means, uh, but let go me ahead. add something that's, uh, that I should have mentioned before. Everyone's now saying how sorry they are for Morris Bishop and, you know, how terrible the government was that overthrew him. But when Morris Bishop was alive and in power, the United States government did everything it could to make life tough for him. They, they had an economic boycott of Grenada. They were denouncing him for trying to build an airport to increase the country's uh, access to tourism and to export and import markets saying that was a military airport, which was not the case. Uh, when he came to Washington, he could hardly get the time of day from anyone. So it's a bit late to suddenly say, oh, what a shame he was overthrown by this brutal group. We have a call waiting. Is this Rahway, New Jersey? <coughs> yes, I have a question for uh, Mr. Christopher. Uh, <coughs> I've been watching your program for the last couple of weeks, ever since the uh, United States uh, invaded uh, Granada. And my question was to you and uh, there were several congressmen on the program before, and thou, uh, some of Mr. Lincoln and uh, different other congressmen from different states, and they are without, they were supporting the administration uh, for invading Granada. My question to you and, and, and to the moderator of this program is why is it that each one of those congressmen speaks about uh, the administration had a right to go in because uh, to ensure the uh, democracy and bring back uh, free, ele hell, free election to, to be held. Why is it that none of, you, none of the press have mentioned, and including New York Times, which I read quite often, the, that the, press, the administration have not demand free election in, in South Africa? Why is it that uh, none of these uh, callers all across the country that live in this, in this country and not concerned about democracy and just in, in Granada, but not, not democracy in South Africa, democracy in Haiti, democracy in, in the Philippines. Why is it that we have a lopsided foreign policy? On one hand, we want to see that uh, we're so concerned about the bishop, which, we, which the administration did not care anything about, and uh, mm -hmm. you know this, and the people in, 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 the, in the White House know this, the Congress know this. Now they're all so concerned about the bishop got murdered, and, uh, and they want to go in and guarantee the right for democracy. President Reagan needed an excuse to raid the country. And when the bishop got murdered, that was an excuse to go in to, to uh, overthrow the government. Now, you know this, the moderators program know this, and the Congress know this, and everyone, and everyone in the free society know this. But my basic concern is with the press. That they did not have made a comparison on South Africa and the democracy and democracy in Grenada, or democracy in, 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 the, in Haiti. Where is all the democracy, uh, the, the free elections going to be held, and they, and they are so, so concerned about in Nicaragua, or uh, they are so concerned about in, uh, in Grenada, and they are, they're not concerned with them in South Africa. Now, I think, all I think right, Chair, I think you made your there. point. Go ahead, Christopher. Well, listen, I, I, uh, I agree with you. I think that's quite true. I think that, uh, all foreign policies are obviously going to be hypocritical. You know, whoever's in power and whatever government uh, of whatever state uh, we're talking about, there are going to be ambiguities and inconsistencies, but there seems to be an enormous one in the case of this administration, that it is only interested in human rights when or if they can be argued to be threatened by communism or a communist surrogate. That is the only time it will sound the alarm for human rights. I think that's a bad foreign policy. Uh, I think it's an un-American foreign policy in the sense that I think America has an interest in human rights everywhere uh, and a commitment to them, or should have. Um, and I think it's a dangerous foreign policy, too, because it, it simply divides the world into good powers and evil powers and suggests that there'll have to be a final reckoning with evil. And a final reckoning with evil, in this case, everybody knows it and you can see it coming down the road, uh, is a nuclear war. And um, nobody uh, needs to tell you what, what that would mean or, the, or that it would be worse than any conceivable tyranny. Um, so that's my comment to you. I think your mention of South Africa is very timely. I mean, even as we speak, the South African government is designing a permanent system of apartheid and trying to get only the white voters to 
ratify it with some signs of success and not a squeak of protest from the administration about it. I think that, that, that is a disgrace and ought to worry people. Christopher Hitchens has been the Washington correspondent for The Nation magazine for the last two years, been uh, with The Nation for the last four years, and writes for a number of uh, British publications we'll talk about a little later. Let's go back to the phones to Rubido, California. Good morning. Good morning, Brian. Nice to have you back. Thank you. Nice to hear from you. And uh, I'd like to say I think that the press corps is being told by the American public that they're really not doing their job. There's no trust anymore in them. Uh, they're considered irresponsible. That's why a lot of people are no longer taking a newspaper. Let me ask you. I'm sure that could I ask you a question about the press at this moment? Give us a, give us just a thumbnail sketch of what you think the press ought to do as a, an institution. What do you want them to do for you? Well, one thing I consider an echo chamber in my newspaper here, the Press Enterprise, we had just one wire service they take, the AP. So, you know, you just get an echo. You don't, I don't feel that I get anything that isn't biased, that, that, that isn't uh, at times irresponsible. I think it's time that the publishers and the editors um, recognize this and somehow get together and they're going to have to reorganize uh, their, their methods of reporting. Do you ever go out and want to buy something that is biased so that it will either support or be the antithesis of your own view? Well, the only thing you can do is go out and buy eight or ten different things and, and then try to put them all together. And I, I don't think we should have to do that. I, I think that we should have two or three reliable places to go. Um, but I would like to ask your uh, journalists there, there is a law, I understand, in England that if a journalist divulges anything that's against the national security that they can receive death. Could you tell me about that, please? Thank you. I didn't, I didn't understand what you said at the very end. They can Please. receive death. death. I, yeah, yes. yeah, no. Um, we've abolished the death penalty in Britain, um, though as a matter of fact, it is in reserve for acts of high treason. Uh, I don't think this would be covered by what you're talking about. It is true that in Britain there's an extremely severe law called the Official Secrets Act, which says that anything the government defines as a secret is a secret. Um, it's a catch-22 law. I mean, you can define something that is well known by everybody as a secret under that law and uh, convict somebody for telling it. Are American um, journalists freer than British journal journalists? Infinitely. How? Well, because you have a constitution. See, my country doesn't have a constitution. Uh, the United States Constitution specifically enjoins Congress from making any law to restrict the freedom of the press or freedom of speech or freedom of expression. So your First Amendment is a tremendous guarantee that uh, you can be told the truth. That doesn't mean the press only tells the truth. Um, and I'm very sorry that you don't take the trouble either to go to the library if you don't want to buy a lot of papers, because I, I know they're expensive, but at least perhaps to buy one national newspaper a week. I mean, say the Wall Street Journal, which has an extremely good uh, news coverage, uh, or the New York Times or the Washington Post. Um, I, I think you really owe it to yourself to, uh, to get more than one newspaper. Christopher Hitchens, let's go to Cambridge, Maryland. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Thank you very much. Mr. Hitchens, I have three direct questions, short questions for you, please. Do you feel that Israel has a right to exist within secure borders do you feel that the United States should intervene should Iran or, and or Russia try to close the Straits of Hormuz? And would you seek relief from a 24-hour shoot-on-site curfew from any quarter uh, in which relief might be found? Thank you. All right, thanks for the call. Very good questions, and, and I think I know what you're trying to pin me down on. Uh, on the first, yes, I do, um, but I think the securely recognized borders should not allow for Israeli colonization or occupation of the territory of its neighbors, which is what it's doing now. The right to exist argument has been, um, has been used now to the point where what it's going to mean is that the Israel you're talking about will include the, uh, the annexed and illegally occupied West Bank. Um, so the right to exist argument is going to rebound on those who use it unclearly and who don't say what they mean by Israel. It's very interesting, the Israeli um, government has never said uh, where it thinks the borders of Israel really ought to be and what it would settle for. I think it would be an immense help if Israel's going to insist on the right to exist, if it tells us where it thinks Israel's boundaries should be. Every other country does do that. <coughs> Excuse me, the, on the front page of USA Today it says one in four of us will get a cold this month. 
and I think that today was my turn. Um, the Straits of Hormuz, look, they're international and vital, and no, no attempt to close them could be countenanced by the international community. When you say, what should the United States do, you only put the question in a, in a narrower way. The United States would have the same right as every other country to be concerned about closure of an international shipping lane. Um, for a 24-hour curfew, well, um, let's just turn it round on you. Suppose that you lived in a part of uh, the United States uh, that one day, unhappily, perhaps because of rioting, um, had to have a 24-hour curfew. And suppose that you lived in a part of Miami, which is, I think, the last place that was a curfew that I can think of, where most of the population was foreign, say Haitian. Do you think the government of Haiti has the right to land troops to safeguard Haitians? If you think it has the right to do that, which you might think it did, do you think it has the right to change the United States government while it's about it? All these arguments, all these arguments, the 24-hour curfew, the nature of the government that replaced Bishop, the possible, arguable, very disputable threat the students were under are all designed to evade this point. Does the United States have the right to choose the government of, Gr of Grenada or does it not? Christopher Hitchens, The Nation magazine. We go to Missoula, Montana. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, disagree with the comment that Mr. Hitchens made that the fact that the uh, runway being built on Grenada was only going to be for uh, to expand tourist trade and export-import trade. I think it's obvious that that's not true by uh, the activities that were found there and the amount of arms and all. Uh, the, uh, my main question is that uh, the press has been making an awful issue out of the supposed uh, censorship of the Grenada operation. Yet when you look at uh, some press programs, uh, for instance, uh, the CBS program, 60 Minutes, if uh, the press is going to be so insistent on uh, no censorship at all. Why shouldn't C CBS be required to air the complete, all of the complete interviews that they take when they uh, go out to do a program like 60 Minutes, instead of only clipping out the things that uh, show the, uh, the idea that they want to get across? Why shouldn't they be subjected to the same kind of lack of censorship that they are crying so much about now. Well, I'll start with your second point. There's obviously a difference between censorship and editing. I mean, we have an hour this morning, David and I. Uh, we could um, obviously ha be forced to answer until we dropped. I mean, how many people rang up all day? You could make us do that, but it would be impossible, and actually no one would want to watch it after a bit. So you must distinguish editing from, from censorship. Censorship is saying you cannot print something or you'll be put in a position where it's impossible for you to print something or air something. Um, editing is, is deciding which are the relevant bits. Obviously, it's a job that you've got to... You can't really trust anyone to do it. I mean, it's, it's putting somebody in a godlike position, but it, it, somebody does have to. Um, the airport, you, you're just wrong about that. It wasn't a military airport, and it would have been very hard to adapt it into being one. The British firm that was building it, Plessy, a large electronics firm in, in the United Kingdom, has been quite definite about it. It says that the specifications for the airport were purely commercial. Uh, the fact that there were weapons found there is a, is a separate question. I mean, the, the Cuban workforce there was armed because it believed that there might be a United States invasion of Grenada. Everyone at the time said how paranoid they were. Um, it seems that the decision to have weapons wasn't a stupid one. Bloomington, Minnesota. Good morning. Morning, Wayne. Uh, I'd like to talk to your guest about the press, about uh, the press being kept out of Granada. Well, they're not the only ones. Uh, they kept out carpenters and bricklayers and doctors and lawyers and almost anything you could think about. So they're, you know, they weren't the only ones. Uh, Do you think the president served himself well by keeping the press out? Pardon me, I didn't hear you. Do you think the president made the right political decision by keeping the press out? Has he won that battle? He threw himself on a political grenade. Did he win? Pardon me? Did he win? I hope, hope so. Uh, there's 100,000 people free today. Uh, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Okay. How about a question for Mr. Hitchens? And uh, let's see my notes here. Uh, 
that we have so many journalists that call themselves journalists, but aren't really. Uh, very few that I've heard on your program have journalist degrees. Uh, well, I don't for one. Do you think you should have a journalism degree to, to be a journalist? Well, they call themselves professionals. Uh, you know, a bricklayer can be a journalist. Sure. No okay. reason, there's no, absolutely no reason why not. In fact, that's why I'm, I'm not particularly in favor of journalism degrees. Actually, in the country I come from, we don't, we don't have those. Um, but there's absolutely no reason why a, a bricklayer, if he's interested in finding out and telling the truth, wouldn't make a good journalist overnight. It's been done. Um, by the way, when you say, you seem to have bricklayers on your mind a bit, that bricklayers were also kept out of Grenada. The fact is, if you keep the press out, you don't need to keep out any other Americans. By keeping out the press, you keep the rest of America in the dark automatically. Now, if you really mean that you don't want to be told what your government is doing with your money abroad, then just don't turn on the news. But there are a lot of people who do think that they ought to know and do want to know what foreign policy is like at the bayonet point. And um, I don't see what's illegitimate about that desire. Do you? Palm Springs, California. Good morning. Yes, uh, I'd like to ask uh, uh, your um, speaker there, uh, if he had known 24 hours or even 48 hours before the invasion of Granada, um, would you have kept it out of press if you'd been asked to? I'm just curious. No. I also have a second question. You'd put it in press? Sure. You would, have, you would have let them know ahead of time that we were coming? Oh, no, they, they knew. It's you who didn't know. The Grenadians have known for a long time that an invasion was coming. Oh, they did? Sure. They've been on, the Grenadians have been on invasion alert almost permanently for the last year. I'll tell you, when, when they really knew, um, another thing wasn't very well reported or told to the American people, when the, um, when, when the invasion was rehearsed, which was about a year ago, long before the coup, long before, okay. the, de long before the death of Bishop, there was a, a, an amphibious exercise in the Caribbean d designed to um, replicate an invasion of Grenada. Uh, can I ask you another question? Please. Um, you said earlier that you were sort of a liberal radical. Does that mean that you um, sort of embraced the socialist view a little bit more than most liberals? Well, when I was in the United Kingdom, I was a member of the Labour Party, which calls itself a socialist party, is a member of the Socialist International. And uh, I haven't resigned that membership, um, except in in the formal sense that I, I no longer carry a Labour Party card. So sure, yeah. Christopher Hitchens, what is your reaction when you hear Americans say that their press is liberal? Do you think that's an accurate accounting of what the press is? Well, I think it's true to say that the press in America is skeptical. I mean, in that it considers part of its job to challenge the government's view. Um, and I think that's true, certainly, of the Washington Post and of the New York Times and of the Wall Street Journal, that they will not just take the government's word for it. Uh, politically speaking, there are great differences between the three. I mean, the Wall Street Journal, though it's skeptical of the government, is very conservative politically um, and takes basically the view of, the view of business. Um, the New York Times and the Washington Post, I think, do have a predominantly liberal cast to some of their reporting, yes. But it's pretty mild. New York City, good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Yes, I'd like to talk to your guest. First of all, I want to thank you for your programs, which I enjoy enormously. Thank you. The guest uh, uses the uh, term for himself as a liberal radical, which I think is a new invention. In the 30s, 40s, and 50s, that wing of the Liberal Party were called fellow travelers. And a fellow traveler is someone who, though not a communist himself, promotes Soviet political positions until they can become mainstream. Well, that's the intent. And they've been very successful. If you can think of how the words have changed, very few people even call communists communists. They now call them Marxist radicals. Um, socialist. Now, there's a difference between a communist country and a socialist country. Sweden is a socialist country. The Soviet Union, China, are communist dictatorships. They've done that. They've also uh, made mainstream the division between the communists and the free world. They call it East-West. This is something you now hear in the United Nations. They think it's just uh, uh, that has nothing to do with the way of life. And when he talked about reporters in World War II, 
reporters like er Ernie Pyle, we had a very patriotic uh, journalistic uh, core at the time. And the reason for that is that the Soviet Union at the time was forced to join us. Because prior to the Soviets' entry into World War II, we were being sniped at, just the way they do now. But because the Soviets, we were in alliance with the Soviet Union, we had a total dedicated core. No one would think of sniping at what we were doing. That's why the flag went up in Iwo Jima, and it, it's been a patriotic symbol. Do you ever read the Nation uh, caller? Pardon me? Do you ever read uh, Mr. Hitchens' magazine, The Nation? Oh, God, yes. It's a rag. It's a rag. Do you, rag. Do you, how do you define your own politics? I'm a Democrat. Okay. I'm a Democrat. And there have been, uh, been anti-communist liberals. That's been a tradition. We are enlightened uh, anti-communists. We just know that communism is a dictatorship. And all this young man has to do is talk to some of my friends who've lived in the Soviet Union and have been imprisoned for no reason. Okay. Or Listen. in Romania or some of those countries and to know that this is where they should put their spotlight on what's going on in those countries and not compare with our small operation in Grenada to Afghanistan. All right. Thank you very much for the call. T talk a little bit about your... your Sure. own personal philosophy. Uh, do you find yourself sympathetic to a communist government? Just start with that as a strong question. Uh, no, I was going to start with that, actually. Um, the Nation is, I think, the only magazine in the country that has a regular column called Sovieticus, uh, which is devoted to the study of the political system of Eastern Europe. It's written by Professor Stephen Cohen of Princeton, who's an expert on the subject, so much so that um, the lady needn't worry. His books are indeed banned in the Soviet Union. I mean, she's, I can let, let me reassure you on that score. There are no illusions left um, about the nature of the Soviet system. Um, and I don't believe the nation can be accused of giving them any longer a life than anybody else. Um, the thing about anti-communism is that it can justify anything. And that has been the lesson of the anti-communist liberalism preached by this lady. When she says that in the 50s, uh, our position, my position, was known as fellow traveling, called fellow traveling, she should say by whom it was called that. I mean, and she should say if she's nostalgic for a period when Americans could be politically invigilated and bullied by Senator McCarthy. If she wants that, she should say so, and not just simply say, in those days, that's what we were called. One of the nation's finest hours, in my opinion, was opposing uh, the witch hunting uh, policy of the senator and his political sidekicks. Now, my own position, um, in case I'm accused of concealing it, um, let me say it now, uh, this, if I haven't said it already. Um, I've already said I was a member of the Labour Party in Britain. The Labour Party is a member of the Socialist, Socialist International. That's the, the family of socialist parties that comprises Francois Mitterrand, the Sandinista movement in Nicaragua, and the British Labour Party, the Swedish Socialist Party, and many others. Um, I still consider myself a member of that political family, and uh, I don't feel that coming out with it on the air is, as it were, a confession. It's just an affirmation. If I'd known you were so interested in my private political views, I'd have put them near the top of the show. Christopher Hitchens of the Ma Nation's Magazine, the Nation Magazine. He's located here in Washington. The magazine's headquartered in New York? It's headquartered in New York. 60,000 circulation? How big a staff? 60,000 and climbing, can I say? Can I get away with that? Uh, bigger staff, very small staff. I mean, on the editorial side, only about half a dozen of us. Most of them in New York? Most of them. All of them, all of them but me in New York, yeah. San Francisco, good morning. Good morning. Uh, good. It's good to have someone that uh, sort of agrees with me <laughs> <laughs> this morning on your program. Um, I was watching McNeil Air Report, I think I don't know if it was last week or the week before, uh, but he had Under Secretary Dam on there, and uh, one of the two asked him about the interview or the meeting that he had had with Bishop in Washington before all this happened. And uh, they had asked him if uh, the United States had asked um, uh, Mr. Bishop about the, the, the Cubans in, uh, in Grenada. And Mr. Dam said they had never talked about that. And also, there's one thing I'd like to know, which is uh, a comment that I don't hear anymore. Did uh, Mr. Bishop ask the United States for help, uh, maybe financial help, to build that runway? Mm -hmm. And I guess that's about all I have to ask. All right, San Francisco. What, what do you read out there? Uh, the Chronicle in the morning. You have it yet? Yes, right here in front of me. What do they do this morning with the news? 
Uh, they got uh, the pictures of the grenade, the coup leaders, Arafat rebels, battle rebels at last stronghold, and the big telephone switch. FBI probes uh, breach of Stanford computer. General's party defeated in Turkey. U.S. says it's winning its war on the mafia and a proposal for interim government. I haven't read it yet because it's a little dark out here. Okay. Thank you very much for the call. Um, yes, Bishop did ask the United States for help, as far as we know. He certainly asked them to stop hindering his other appeals for aid to organizations like the IMF um, and the World Bank. Uh, I don't know whether he asked to be included in President Reagan's Caribbean Basin Initiative, which did include block grants for Caribbean islands, but I suspect that he may have done, because they'd taken great care to freeze the Grenadian government out. And Grenada, you see, is a country of, uh, difficult to describe from my visit there, how poor it is. It really doesn't have an economy. I mean, even if, however much of a socialist you are, there's nothing there to nationalize. I mean, there just isn't anything. And they had one very, very small airport on the wrong side of the island, and on the wrong side of the mountains from the capital. And we're trying to build it, uh, build, a, build a better one. Um, I think probably United States aid for building the airport was requested. The odd thing is that the United States says that it's the government of Venezuela and the oil fields of Venezuela that were threatened by the, the airport at St. George's. And uh, it, the Venezuelan government, oddly enough, was contributing money to the project, um, perhaps not believing that it was threatened by the airport. If somebody wanted to get a copy or subscribe to The Nation, where do they go? Ah, they should write to 72 Fifth Avenue, New York City, New York 10011, and uh, mention my name and they'll treat you right. That's 72 Fifth Avenue. New York City. New York City. New York. 111. 111, exactly. Well, one actually 10,011. I, I always have to worry right. with zip codes. 10011. Okay, we'll try to give that one more time. You want to jot it down in case in some nicely. newsstands around the country have it, although it's hard to find. That's not a comment on your circulation department. It's probably a comment on the space <laughs> on the newsstand. Don't, don't tempt me. War Minister, Pennsylvania. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Good, sir. How are you? Fine. What do you read? I read uh, just my local papers uh, from, from the standpoint that I don't uh, subscribe to any of the, uh, the larger newspapers. What is your local paper? My local paper is the Daily Intelligence and uh, basically it carries uh, local news as well as some selected uh, national interest items. Where is your city located? What's, cl what's it close to? Uh, it's about 30 miles north of Philadelphia. Okay, thank you very much. Go ahead with okay. your comment. Uh, I'd just like to comment on the press issue. Um, many journalists uh, that I see today uh, seem to uh, forget that even though free press is a right, there may be some priorities within the rights of our own Constitution, and that being self-preservation of our national interests. Um, when you take a look at uh, world, past world the history uh, and the like, even as recent as the Falklands, the, the Britons restricted their press yeah. uh, so, so severely that they, did, uh, they kept them on, on ships and the like. Uh, when, when journalists lose their credibility, and I think in this country journalists have lost their credibility, based upon their past performances. Uh, the American people are speaking out now. And I, I just feel that without no type of checks and balances on the journalists, they're doing exactly what this gentleman's doing here. They bring a foreign news agent over into the country, okay, report on all the faults, okay, but don't take a deep enough look at the, at the positive uh, aspects of what a free press really is. I'm getting fed up with this kind of questioning, actually. I mean, 30 miles from f north of Philadelphia as you are, how do you presume to know that the American people are speaking out? To the extent that you do know, or to the extent that you can speak for them, no, you can only know it through reading, the, the, reading a free press and watching a free TV. The, f the truth is that the, the papers are reporting the fact that they're unpopular with the administration, and the column with which David began, Luke Cannon's column today, says he, he admits it's true that public opinion is probably on Reagan's side on this one. But if you want your press to be treated as the British treated their press in the Falklands, you're going to end up not knowing very much about what's going on. If that's what you want, don't read the papers, but do not prevent me or anyone else from reading them. Okay, it, well, the, the whole aspect or the whole problem is how do I know, it, it's by watching programs like C-SPAN where there is 
uh, reaction and there is comments and there is interaction between the people. It's certainly not by um, uh, reading tabloids and magazines such as yours, which has been so severely edited or slanted. How do you know that if you don't read it? I would never read it because it's, you know, only from the simple point that I know how an editor works. Well, you're obviously very lucky. You don't, you don't need to be told anything. You don't need to read anything. You just know. Now, not everyone is as smart as you. Give them a chance. Yeah, well, we'll give them the chance, okay, if you do the likewise. Okay, let's go on to Campbell, California, for Christopher Hitchens of The Nation magazine. Go ahead, please. Okay, first I'd like to say congratulations on his last answer. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to find out another thing. I do believe that the press hasn't gone deep enough in Grenada, but in one sense, I keep waiting to see an interview with the students who were left there, the ones that decided not to come back, mm -hmm. and the reasons why. How many were left there, uh, caller? Do you know? I, uh, that's something I still haven't found out. I've been waiting to find out. I uh, believe it was a third to two-thirds were left there. What are your suspicions? My suspicions are they were left, uh, they decided to stay there because they saw no reason to come back. Are you surprised about uh, Congressman Michael Barnes's response after visiting Grenada? Did you hear that? I haven't heard it yet. Uh, he said this morning in the paper, uh, I guess he didn't say it to the paper necessarily, but he said that he had changed his mind uh, about the invasion. He is a liberal Democrat from the suburbs here of, uh, of Washington, and I'm trying to find the exact quote so I don't misrepresent him. But uh, let me just re let me find it so that I can read it to you. Here he said, uh, I came down here very skeptical, but I have reluctantly come to the conclusion that the invasion was justified. What do you think? I think are justified. It's... Uh Unfortunate, though, that anybody from any country had to die to be the justification. I, I truly believe that the whole problem was overblown, and I think there could have been other ways found to uh, solve the problem other than this rushing in there and killing people. Okay. Christopher Hitchens? Well, um, you, you obviously tuned in a little late, so I, I don't want to bore the people who've been watching all the way through, but I also want to answer your question. I have I already said that I... I think that even if it could be proved that all the students were in danger, that would only justify a rescue of the students on the lines of the Israeli action at Entebbe or the attempted United States action in, in, in Iran. It doesn't justify overthrowing the government of Grenada, even if it's a repulsive one. Now, as to the ones who stayed behind, we haven't discussed that yet. I don't know. I went to that, to that medical school. I took a great care to go when I was in Grenada and talked to the students there, all of whom liked Grenada and the Grenadans who are indeed very nice people. Uh, understood that the government was hostile to the United States, but didn't feel that hostility expressed in any way towards themselves, I wouldn't be at all surprised that a lot of them wanted to remain. It's well, a delightful island, aside why, from anything Why else. is a school there in the first place? Well, um, it's there because, uh, I, I just for the moment can't remember his name, but there's a very... Medico? Uh, yeah, a very devoted man, that's right, who just thinks that there are a lot of people who don't get into medical school in the United States who deserve a chance to practice medicine, and he's found it. Why he chose Grenada, I, I simply don't know. Um, but it, it's its own justification, if you see the island, it's such a beautiful place. Uh, decided to, a place for second chance students. Um, Is it a case I where they pay a lot of money to go there? I think they, they, it's a fee-paying establishment, yes. Once graduated, can they come back here and practice medicine in the United States? Yes, I believe they can. Yes, they can. I mean, it, it, the, the diplomas given there are recognized. Yeah. Um, that. It's, it's interesting also because that's more likely to mean that the students are going to be conservatives, I think. I mean, those who haven't made it into medical school here but who want to practice in private medicine uh, and, and go to Grenada to do so are not likely to be on the left, shall we say. Miami, Florida, good morning. You're on with Christopher Hitchens of The Nation magazine. Good morning. Morning. Uh, the comment that I'd like to make, uh, it's not really a question, is I'm having a lot of trouble with uh, the attitude of the press in uh, looking at this whole situation in Granada as only a security problem and not looking at themselves and saying, why uh, is the a public against us and why is, did the president do this? In the sense that in a republic that we live in, the freedoms that we have carry responsibilities with them. And the responsibility is to look at what we're doing and see whether or not it affects uh, the well-being and welfare of other people. And I think the press, at a time when we need unity to be united, 
uh, and stand behind our president is not the time for the press to come in with their uh, interpretations and try to sway the public. Whether it's their intent or not, that's what happens. And I think our Congress is just as guilty. And we need to, in a situation like this, let happen what happens and then critique it. And there is your freedom of the press. This is really becoming the theme of the day, isn't it? Um, so I'll, let, let me go at it from one more angle. I don't know if, you've, if any of you out there who've been taking the line that this lady's just taken have noticed the ironic position that you're in, but none of the discussion that we're having none of the questions you're putting to me or criticisms you're making of the press could be made if the press wasn't the way you don't believe it ought to be. That's to say, able to criticize, able to report everything. Um, you, I don't think you know how lucky you are. Uh, I was told by an earlier caller from New York, a lady from New York, to imagine what life was like living in the Soviet Union. I don't actually have to imagine that. I have seen those countries and I have uh, been in other countries too where there's no press freedom believe me your system is better and ev everyone else in the in the world envies the right of a United States citizen to have a First Amendment guaranteeing his or her right to know and making it impossible illegal in fact for the government to restrain freedom of expression is there any other country in the world that has the kind of freedom we have no no, no. Phoenix Arizona good morning yeah good morning I wonder why the, the media, they don't report the right of the Palestinian to exist. They always report the right of Israel to exist. And, you know, it's, they, the, the Palestinian, they have the right, you know, like any other people in the earth. Caller, are you a Palestinian? No, I'm not. I'm Egyptian. You're Egyptian? Yes. Uh, do you think that our American press is biased toward Israel? Oh, of course. Like, uh, we give... You know, I'm an American citizen. Mm -hmm. We give to Israel $29 billion a year, uh, while American people, they needed much more, you know, than, than to give it to Israel. You know, we wasted on Israel for their aggression and going and occupy, you know, more land and killing more people and they grow in. And, and like Mr. Hutchins said, you know, they have no border. They did not claim their border. You know, when they will be safe, when their border next to New York, you know, uh, doesn't make sense. Okay. Let me ask you, Christopher Hitchens, mm -hmm. about what we're hearing this morning uh, from the callers. Uh, it seems like there's uh, a lot of unhappiness about the press and the media. Yeah. And, and coming from all different sides. Why? Well, I think, I mean, I don't think it's, it's mysterious. And I think that uh, Lou Cannon identifies it quite well. I think there is a very strong feeling among Americans that when your own young men are risking their lives that everyone should close ranks and that criticism is in some sense disloyal. I think that's very understandable and very human feeling but I think it's mistaken because it's precisely at those moments when you need a very very clear sense of what you're doing and you can only arrive at such a clear sense by an open debate. So tough though it is uh, for the press I think it's got to stick to its guns and I think no, I have never met an American who wishes he hadn't been told what was going on in Vietnam even though they often disliked what they were seeing. You mustn't confuse the message with the messenger. And I'm afraid that's what a lot of people are doing here. But I've no difficulty seeing why they do it, and, and in a sense, you know, sympathizing, but, but finally disagreeing. Uh, can I just answer our Egyptian caller? Just a moment. I want to tell our audience that for the last oh, hour, their guest uh, here on the program has been Christopher Hitchens of The Nation magazine. And uh, Mr. Hitchens has... Uh, quite a ba background in, in education from uh, England where he went to Lee School at Cambridge and Oxford uh, studied uh, philosophy politics and economics graduated in 1970 um, has been with the nation for four years here in Washington for the last two years as the Washington correspondent our first hour is up
one, having acknowledged it, one has to try and deal with it and come down to a decision which one hopes has taken everything into account. I'm willing to be uh, criticized for the conclusions I reach, but not for reaching a conclusion. Um, as for the export of revolution and so on, yeah, listen, I mean, the Sandinista government does believe that the uh, hemisphere is far 